Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Ah, well done. Well, are you good? I thought when Pastor Mark said, and coming up tonight, I thought he was going to say, and coming up tonight is the Cricket World Cup final, Australia versus India. Go the Australians. Come on, all of our, most of our Indian congregation are at our Collingwood Park location today and uh, <laughs> that's not so good. Listen, we've got to win some kind of World Cup, don't we? You know, we weren't very good in the Union. Um, football we're not good at, really. Although we did beat Bangladesh 7-0, that was pretty good. Anyway, are you good? I'm good. Uh, yeah, we had our finance seminar just yesterday, had about 40 people roughly come and, and uh, the plan with that is this, I really felt at the start of the year, the Lord asked me and said, do you pastor a church? I said, Yes. And, he, and I was like, what kind of question is that? <laughs> and he goes, no, I haven't called you to pastor a church. I've called you to pastor the city. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, that's a different mindset. And uh, we, yes, we exist for the saints, absolutely. That's why we come together as a church, uh, to encourage each other, to inspire each other, not to be better Christians, but to be active Christians. Two different things, all right? <laughs> And uh, I really believe that we are called as a church to pastor a city. And so I've been, uh, we've been doing a few different things uh, uh, um, this year that we're pushing forward with. One of them is Circuit Breaker, which uh, Pastor Ken and Lorraine are running. And that goes every term. We run a, a, a course called Circuit Breaker, where we, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, biggest uh, the, the biggest things in our city, in fact, in, in Australia, Ipswich is one of the highest per capita when it comes to domestic violence. And so we're looking into that space and going, okay, how can we make a, uh, our, our, our redemptive difference in that area? And so we're running a program called Circuit Breaker, right, which helps people uh, understand their emotions and not to let their emotions get the better of them. That's the grand plan of this. Anyway, Ken's been going into the prisons now with this. And yesterday, they baptized seven people in the prison system. How cool is that? Right? That's so cool. So, so cool. Jesus and Matthew, he, he, he talks about this. He, he, says, he says, hey, uh, to some Christians who want to get into heaven, and Jesus said, actually, you, you can't get in. And they said, why not? We've been casting out devils in your name, and we've been preaching in your name. And Jesus said, yeah, but you didn't visit me in prison. And he said, when, did you, uh, when were you in prison, Jesus? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to un, unto me. And so I need you to know that as a church, we are going into those spaces and places, right, preaching Jesus, and people are getting saved. How cool is that? Let's give God some praise again, right? It's the Holy Spirit who builds the church, not just us. So that's really cool. So well done to Ken and Lorraine. That's fantastic. Uh, we're going to continue uh, our series called Journey. Uh, life is a journey. Um, you know, you get born, and when you're born, you don't just have the wholeness of life right there and then, right? Who knows that life is a journey from uh, birth to when it's time for you to go and meet Jesus, right? That life is a journey, and uh, discipleship is a journey. When you become a Christian, well, maybe yours was different, certainly mine was, is I became a Christian, and then I've had Throughout my Christian walk, I'm learning and journeying with Jesus and learning to become more like Jesus. Uh, maybe you got saved and maybe you just hit perfection straight up. Well done to you, right? Uh, but discipleship is a journey, right? And so that's what we're about here at Centro Church. We want to partner with people in our city and certainly begin the journey of life. Jesus says, I've come to give life and life to its fullest, right? Life now, not life later but you can have it right now, but there's a journey toward that. And so we exist as a church to pastor a city. Isn't that cool, right? And so as part of this, we've been talking about different aspects of life and of the journey of life. And I want to preach part two to a thought that I did three weeks ago here called Future Proofing Your Family. And we didn't finish it. And so I thought, let's get into part two and uh, look at how do we make sure that our family finishes the race that God has 
for you, maybe you've heard the phrase, you can't choose your fr- uh, uh, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family, right? And there's certainly truth to that. Uh, you're going to live with your family. You, you've got no option. Uh, these people are going to do life with you. And the journey of family is long. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's sometimes scary. It's sometimes sad. It's, it lifts you up, but sometimes it can also let you down. But despite all the detours of family, and despite all the pitfalls and everything in between, healthy family is a journey. Notice I said healthy, not perfect, right? There's no such thing as a perfect family, but certainly what you can aim toward is a healthy family. Uh, Paul says this in Hebrews, he says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. And so this morning, well, throughout this series, we're looking at certain principles, uh, biblical principles, that when we uh, base our life on these principles of looking toward Jesus and looking toward the Word, the, the, the grand idea is that as we look toward Jesus, all those pitfalls right, become just moments in our peripheral, right, all the pitfalls, all the, uh, the sin that easily entangles us, right, doesn't seem to have as much power anymore when we focus in on Jesus. And so three weeks ago, we started it and we looked at point number one, if you want to future-proof your family and make sure that your family will last the distance, the first thing you have to do is kiss the world goodbye. Uh, who knows that our worldly system, the culture of the day, Um, has a system of busyness. Uh, There's a system of individuality. Uh, There's a system of materialism. Uh, There's a system of, I want what I want. Uh, I want to have what I want no matter what other people say. I'm going to get what I want. That's the system. But we aren't uh, people of the world. The Bible says that we are aliens, right? We are aliens of the world. We are kingdom people, yeah? yeah? And so we live by kingdom principles, Right? So we're going to kiss the world goodbye and embrace kingdom principles. Number two was we need to pursue grace and eliminate perfection. Now, perfection is unattainable. No one's perfect, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, but what you can chase and what you can attain is grace, right? And so we pursue grace and eliminate perfection. And we're getting on to number three this morning. Number three is this. If you want to future-proof your family, right? Maybe you don't have a family yet. Uh, maybe you're wanting to get married one day, uh, then listen up, right? Uh, maybe you're, uh, um, you know, got grandkids um, that you are, um, uh, uh, you know, almost parenting yourself, right? Uh, this is help for you. This should be for everyone, not just family, but even friends, right? People who, have in, who you have in your home. Uh, these are just great principles for relationships in general. But number three is this, to future-proof your family. Number three, resolve conflict constructively and promptly, if you want a future, if you want to make sure that your marriage lasts the distance, if you want to put principles in place that make sure that your family and, and your relationships with your friends last the distance, then we have to become masters at resolving conflict constructively and promptly. Uh, there's a few things in life that you can guarantee are going to happen. Um, like the sun rising tomorrow, right? That's going to happen, Right? Uh, sometime this week, you're going to get a phone call from a telemarketer, right? That's going to happen, right? If, uh, I can guarantee this, that if you uh, uh, shop with Optus, sometime next year, you're going to get hacked or, or not phone someone, right? That's, that's going to happen, right? Uh, there's some things in life that you can guarantee. I can guarantee this, that you are going to experience conflict. I can guarantee that, right? You are going to have it. You're going to go through times in your life where conflict is going to happen. It's inevitable. So we may as well get the tools to manage and resolve tension in relationships. Uh, Because the truth is that whenever you have two people, you have two experiences and two opinions. Right? Whenever you have ten people, you have ten experience and ten opinions. And here lies the breeding ground for conflict or resolution. Because the truth is, whatever you practice, 
that's what you get good at, yeah? If you practice conflict, then you're going to get really good at creating conflict. But if you practice resolution, then you're going to get really good at resolving conflict in your life. And my question is, what do you practice regularly? Uh, Practicing conflict resolution is hard. Uh, Let's not kid around ourselves here. It takes time. Uh, It takes emotional energy. It takes confidence. You know, how, how do you approach someone and, and, and talk about uh, issues? Uh, it takes practice, you know, to be a great uh, a doer of conflict resolution. There's a great uh, space documentary. It's got nine, episo- nine episodes to it. It's a great space documentary. What's it called? Star Wars. That's what it is. <laughs> Star Wars. <clears throat> and in this documentary, in this document, don't, my wife is booing. She refuses to watch it. She refuses to watch it with me. All right? How can you boo without even watching it? Seriously. No comments from the front, please. Only from the second row onwards. (laughs) It's this great scene in Star Wars where uh, Luke Skywalker, his X Wing is trapped in the mud. Maybe you remember it in the swamp. And he can't get it out. And Yoda starts teaching him how to use the Force. I want you to look at the screen and see what happens. We'll never get it out now. So certain are you. Always with you, what cannot be done. Do you nothing that I say? Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do, or do not. There is no try. <laughs> I love it. No, do, or do not. There is no try. That's cool. Anyway, love it. <laughs> That's my best one. <laughs> but I wonder how many of us find ourselves in the relational swamp, you know, where it's just like Luke, ah, it's, it, there's no point anymore. Right? I, I can't win. Uh, I, I can't get the breakthrough. It's, it's all done. I wonder how many times we use that kind of language. Right? I just, I can't do it. But I'll try, I've tried it. Right? Here's the thing about conflict resolution. Right? Conflict resolution is just like that. It's not something that we try, but it's something that we do or don't do. Uh, but you know, don't understand him. I've, I've tried to be kind before. It didn't work. But I've tried to do it again. Right? It's not something that we try and see if it works. It's something that we do, right? And let me say this. Even if you feel like that you're in the swamp right now and there's no point in trying to be nice to the other people who are creating conflict, still do, right? Still do. Don't try because eventually you will get victory, right? Conflict's going to happen, so we may as well get good at solving it. So how do you do that? How do you solve conflict? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is this, is in uh, Romans 3, 23, it says this, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Meaning this, if you want to be great at resolving conflict, the first thing that you have to understand is that that person is sinful and you are sinful, right? That's the base right there, is that we are both broken, uh, broken, fallen people, right? That's a great base to start from knowing, okay, they've screwed up, I've screwed up. Um, that's a great place to go, okay, let's try to work this out because no one is better than each other here, yeah. right? That's the first base that we should start one. Like, take my family, for example. <laughs> Tread carefully, Tim. Take my family, for example. In my family, there's a liar. There's a cheater. There's someone who maybe sometimes thinks nasty things. Right? There's someone who mainly doesn't think the best of others sometimes. And that's just the dad. Like, don't even get me started about the kids, right, and the wife. Right? <laughs> no one's perfect is what I'm saying. Right? And if we want to be great at solving conflict, we have to come from that base. That none of us are perfect Right? We've all fallen short, but here's the thing. It's how we react and what we do when somebody falls short 
that future proofs the family or not. Right? The question is this when somebody falls short of your expectation, which somebody will, what is your reaction? What are you good at? What is your reaction? Maybe you get angry. Maybe you blame. Maybe when someone falls short, you withhold affection. Do you retreat and become passive? Right? Every relationship is going to have its challenges, right? And its conflicts. But accepting that someone is going to fall, right? Accepting that straight from the start is the first step toward resolution. Right? What do you do next though? Well, 1 Peter 4 8 says this. It says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, right? So everyone has fallen short of the glory of God, right? Everyone has sinned. So what do we do when someone sins against you? Well, right here, Paul tells us what we do is we love earnestly. The word earnest simply just means to pursue, means to run after, means to take hold of, right? We take hold of love because love covers sin, Right? Love covers a multitude of sin. So when someone falls in your relationship, what do you do? You cover them. Right? You cover their sin. Uh, I remember uh, when Noah, after he came out, he got drunk, right? And one of the sons uh, come in and they see their dad naked. They come out and they start telling everyone about the nakedness of their father. Then the other two sons come in and cover the father's sin. The one that exposed it, right, was cursed. The people that covered it were blessed. If you want relationships in your life to be blessed, then we need to cover sin, not expose it to everyone that needs to hear about it, right? Now, obviously, there are certain things that we need to bring into the light. Absolutely, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, uh, 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 not the big, anyway, let's not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> we pursue love. What is love? Love is patience, love is kindness, love is humility, love is honor, love is calmness, right? You cannot resolve conflict without these ingredients. Um, like every great person in the world, my first job was at Macca's, right? And uh, great job, you learn leadership, learn how to cook dodgy burgers, it's, it's all good. Anyway, one day I remember I was working at the North Mackay Macca's and uh, I was on the chicken burger uh, stand and, and this, this order came in uh, for the weirdest chicken burger that you could think of. They, they didn't want uh, the mayo, they wanted Big Mac sauce instead and they didn't want the lettuce, they wanted extra pickles, they wanted cheese and tomato on it. They didn't want the sesame seed bun, they wanted the milk bun. And so I had to make this weird chicken burger, right? And so I put all the ingredients on then I sent it out and about a minute later, 30 seconds, a minute later, it came back. My manager came and said, Tim, um, you stuffed up on the burger. I said, I did not. I put all the ingredients on there. He said, no, 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 you forgot one. I said, I did not forget one. They said, which one did I forget? He said, the chicken. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. All right. uh, I got so caught up with all the other ingredients, I forgot to put the main ingredient on the chicken burger. Right? Patience, kindness, humility, honor, calmness. These are the main ingredients for resolving conflict, right? And when we miss these ingredients, we end up getting maybe something that we haven't ordered. You know, when we're not kind to each other, you know, that's not the husband that I ordered. I ordered an, I ordered an understanding husband. I didn't order him. Uh, I didn't order that wife. I ordered a respectful wife. You know, I didn't order these kids. I ordered good behaving kids. You know, I didn't order them. Um, why are you laughing so much on the front row here? Right? I didn't order that. Uh, but Tim, I ordered a friend who stands with me through thick and thin. I ordered that kind of friend. You know, uh, but Tim, I ordered my kids are in the house of God and I ordered that their future was secure. But they're not here. That's what I ordered, right? And there's some certain ingredients that we need. That when we don't love, we certainly do uh, miss out. Proverbs 25, 28. It says, A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Uh, walls represent boundaries. The city walls keep bad guys out, 
keep the good guys in, right? That's what the city walls do. And boundaries with your emotions, certainly, are a good thing. Boundaryless emotions have a tendency to lash out. Uh, when there's no boundaries on your emotions, they tend to find blame. Uh, they make you become the victim. They overanalyze a situation or maybe exaggerate what really went on. Um, you know, emotions aren't bad things. They're a God-given gift. Emotions done in the right way is awesome. It makes life better. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, be angry, but don't sin. Right? What, he's, what Paul's saying there, uh, uh, um, the rabbis of the day would say this, that sin is anything that breaks echad. Right? Echad was the word peace in, in, in Hebrew. If you do anything that breaks peace between you and God and you and people, that's sin, anything that breaks peace. Um, you know, uh, be angry, but don't break peace. Right? Emotions aren't a bad thing, right? But when they start to get away from us, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity for the devil. They're not bad, but and I'm not saying bottle everything up because it has its own problems, right? But what I'm saying is this, don't let emotions drive. I've heard it once said that emotions are in the car ride of life, but don't let them drive, right? Don't let your emotions drive your car. Uh, when I first got my motorbike license, uh, my wife said, uh, I went and asked, I went and told her that I'm getting a motorbike. <laughs> I said, I'm getting a motorbike, and she said, are you asking? I said, yes. <laughs> she said, two things have to happen for you to get a motorbike. Number one, number one rule is this. If you ever get a speeding ticket on the motorbike, you lose it. I said, cool, great. Policemen don't even chase motorbike riders, that's good. Number two, she said, you have to hang out with some of the motorbike riders in our church and ask them questions and let them teach you some things. I said, okay, cool. So I went to this guy named Warren. Uh, he was on our church board, really, really awesome friend of mine. And uh, he said this to me, and I've never forgotten it, and this is how I ride my motorbike. He said, Tim, every time you go out on the road, you have to assume one thing and one thing only, that every other car driver today is out to kill you. Right. <laughs> Let me say this. When you ride your motorbike with that in thought, right, uh, you are conscious of what's happening on the road. There's an awareness. You become more patient. Right? There's a readiness. And there's an intellect. Right? The same as with conflict resolution. Right? When it comes to emotions... There needs to be an awareness of what's happening in your emotions. There needs to be a patience, right? There needs to be a readiness, right? That something might happen, so I'm ready and my, my, my emotions won't jump to conclusions and drive me. There needs to be an intellect because here's the truth. Emotions at speed or emotions unaware or emotions unchecked can create an emotional crash. And you don't want that, Right? But we have emotions, but we make sure that our emotions are in the boundary of intellect, that they're in the boundary of patience, and that they're in the boundary of uh, uh, things like awareness. Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Right? It doesn't say the power of life and death is in the tongue, and if you eat life then you'll eat good fruit. It says, whatever comes out, you'll eat of its fruit. There is fruit of life and there is fruit of death in your tongue, meaning in, in your speech. And you will eat whatever comes out, right? Whatever kind of words come out, that's what you're going to consume. Whatever comes out first, that's usually the natural one. And that's what we fill up on. And so maybe some of us need to check out what's coming out first. Uh, Kat and I, we started watching a new TV show and uh, we've kind of fallen in love with it. It's called Alone. And maybe you've seen the TV show Alone. It's this survival show where they take 10 people and they drop them in the wilderness, whether it's in Patagonia in the US or in the Arctic or in Mongolia, wherever it is. 
and they drop them about 10 kilometers roughly uh, away from each other and they can't contact each other. They can only take 10 things from home and then it's last man standing. Right, So you have to build your own shelter, you have to get your own food, and you don't know when other people quit. Right, It's last man standing and you have no idea uh, what person, what level you are on the rung. Anyway, we're, we're loving it, it's quite fun. But what's interesting is you can tell who is about to drop out. You can tell who's about to give up. Not by how good their shelter is or how bad it is. Not by what kind of food they have available to them. You can tell who's about to give up by the way that they start speaking, right? They start saying things like, I miss this back home. They start saying things like, "Uh, uh, 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 I wish I had this. Uh, They start saying things like, at the start, I knew I could win, but now I'm not sure. Right? And you can tell who's about to give up, not by anything else other than what they're saying. How do you say things when it comes to conflict? How are you responding with your mouth? Because how you respond will determine how or where you end up. Right? Your speech is important. The ingredients to constructive resolution of conflict is... Realize that we're all flawed, right? Pursue love anyway. Learn how to control your emotions. Speak life. And the last one is forgive in Mark eleven twenty five. 25. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too, right? Isn't that interesting? Bit of a theological conundrum right there, isn't it? Because we're told if we say yes to Jesus and confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that he's Lord, then we're saved. But this one also says, right, actually for your father to forgive you, you also need to imitate the father and forgive those around you. Isn't that interesting? Right? We're not going to get into the theological debate there, but it's certainly what Jesus himself is saying, that we, need, that, that we are people of forgiveness. right? We are people of forgiveness conflict resolution and we forgive forgiving doesn't mean that what the person did is okay that's not what forgiving means doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you know we we will cover it more hide it that's not what it means right Uh, 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 unforgiveness is like trying to stab uh, 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 is like stabbing yourself hoping that the other person is going to get hurt (laughs) It's, it's not how it works forgiveness is you know what you don't owe me anything anymore I'm going to live a life free Forgiveness actually frees your spirit. It actually frees your soul, your soul person, right? Because that person doesn't owe you anymore. You are free, and then spiritually you're free as well, right? Because we are then forgiven by our Heavenly Father. So you preach your proof your family by resolving conflict in a healthy manner. Number four is this. You want to make your family last the distance, future proof it? Number four, we have to be people who disciple our tribe. Disciple your tribe. Don't wait for outside influences to create inside conviction. Right? It's not going to happen. Right? The outside world uh, will not lead your family to inside faith conviction. <laughs> right? It won't do that. It has another agenda. It's going in a different direction. And so discipleship starts and ends with you. Everyone point to yourself, right? Start with you, right? You are the person who disciples your people. Remember that show, Veggie Tales? Who grew up on Veggie Tales? Anyone? Veggie Tales, Veggie Tales, right? Um, I want to show you a quote. Yeah, Sam watched it. Go, Sam, right? I want to show you a quote from Paul Vischer, the creator of Veggie Tales. He said this, I looked back and realized I had spent 10 years trying to convince kids to behave Christianly without teaching them Christianity. And that was, pretty, that was a pretty serious conviction. You can say, hey kids, be more forgiving because the Bible says so. Or, hey kids, be more kind because the Bible says so. But that isn't Christianity, it's morality. We're drinking a cocktail that's a mix of Protestant work ethic, the American dream and the gospel. 
and we've intertwined them so completely that we can't tell them apart anymore. Our gospel has become a gospel of following your dreams and being good so that God will make all your dreams come true. It's the Oprah God, right? The gospel is not a message of morality, right? It is a message of discipleship. And morality is not discipleship. But the big problem that we have is when it comes to uh, uh, the spiritual formation of certainly those around us, we go back to a base model that we've all been taught since we've been born, which is the educational model, right? We all went to school, right? And we all sat down in a classroom and we all had the teacher tell us that we'll use algebra one day. Who's ever used algebra in the real world, right? Anyone? <laughs> Two people. <laughs> I'm getting all the teachers raise their hand. That doesn't count because you use it to teach anyway, right? And, and they tell you all these things and then they test you on it. And they use a reward or a discipline system to know if you were good at retaining information or bad at it. And what we do sometimes, I think, is we bring that kind of model into our homes where we use a reward system of reward or discipline over whether you were good or bad. But here's the thing. Being a Christian isn't about being good or bad. It's about being a disciple, right? It's not about living a life of just morality. Yes, we have moral lives, absolutely, right? But our lives are based around discipleship. The gospel is not about making bad people good, but about making dead people come alive, right? That's what the gospel is about. And so, yes, your home should pursue morality, absolutely, right? Because we, we want to be good, uh, absolutely. But first and foremost, discipleship starts by teaching the people closest to us that we are only good because of Jesus and it's through spiritual transformation and his power and surrendering, us, surrendering ourselves to God's will, that's Christianity and that's discipleship, right? If you pursue, be good because the Bible says so, over we are only good because of Jesus, your house will always lead to moralism over discipleship. And moralism only leads to self-righteousness. Discipleship leads to seeking Jesus because he matters. Moralism leads to right and control. Discipleship leads to humility and order. And both are different. Right? We don't base our homes on you are good and you are bad. We base our homes on what does the master say in this situation? What does discipleship require? Right? What does following Jesus look like in this situation? Discipleship isn't about being good. It's about being with God. Right? Discipleship isn't about being good. It's about being with God. And that's what we teach our people. That's what we teach our, that's what we talk about. Right, it's what is in our homes. We disciple our people. Education without spiritual formation is the same as knowing something without the practice. I went up to the hospital uh, a couple of months ago visiting someone in our church up there and I just walked up there from, from the office here and walked, walked up to the base hospital and it was quite funny. It was, a, it was an interesting conundrum that I found myself in getting to the front door. I was getting to the front door uh, here at the hospital and uh, it was quite funny. There was about eight or ten nurses and doctors out the front and they were on break and I just found this quite ironic. They all were smoking. And I thought to myself, isn't it ironic? No, right? I thought, is this ironic? These people are probably working with someone today who's got lung cancer from smoking. Like, isn't this interesting? They know they shouldn't do it. They're working on someone. But they're doing the very thing they know that they, 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 they shouldn't do. I thought that was just interesting. How often 
do we find ourselves in a situation we knew what the right thing was to do, (laughs) but we didn't do it. There's a difference between education and formation, right? And when it comes to your home, you are the leader of spiritual formation. Now, yes, education is a part of that, right? But there needs to be a formation. There needs to be an experience. Here's some differences between education and spiritual formation, right? Uh, Christian education is about intellect. It's intellectual. But spiritual formation is experiential. Do you have moments in your household or are you putting your people in a position where they can experience the power of God? Right? It's one thing to live in a home where you're, you're told what Jesus would do and you're told what is the right thing to do. That's different right, to creating an experience of the Holy Spirit. That's different to creating an experience of God working in the lives of your people. Uh, education is about memorization. Formation is about meditation. Right? I was, in fact, just uh, talking with my son. I picked him up from youth group on Friday and we're driving home. And I said, who preached tonight? And he said, oh, Pastor Dina preached. I said, oh, was it good? And uh, he goes, yes. Uh, in fact, is Johnny here today? Is Johnny here? No. In fact, he said this. He said, Dad, Dina is probably the best preacher at youth. <laughs> and I was like, hey, okay, don't tell Johnny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that'll hurt him. Anyway, I said, what'd she preach on? And he said, oh, she preached on, you know, just being filled with the word of God and then doing what God says. And I said, okay, so what has God told you to do? My son's 12, right? These are some questions that we should be asking our kids. So what has God told you to do? My son, Malachi, he, he said, but actually God's been speaking to me a lot lately. And I was like, Oh, really? Okay. What about? And uh, he said, oh, he's, I've got this friend at school and he's told me that God wants to use me to get him to church. I said, fantastic. That's good. All right? And so we talked about, okay, so what things are you, uh, are you thinking about? How are you going to do it? Right? And so uh, I say that to say this. Uh, uh, and then we talked about the Bible. Right? And I said, so, uh, how are you hearing from God? Are you, are you reading your Bible? Oh, well, not as much as what I want to do, Dad. I said, okay, cool. Well, well, we'll add the Bible. We'll make sure that we're adding the Bible into your reading list and reading your Bible, right? But the meditation is when you're taking time to think about things, right? And we need to build our families in a way where there's spaces and conversations where we're thinking about the things of God and talking about the things of God, right? Rather than just memorization. Education is corporate. Formation is personal. Education is application, formation is response. Education is extrinsic, formation is intrinsic. Uh, One is uh, extrinsically motivated, intrinsically motivated, right? Let's be people that know how to disciple our tribe, right? Um, I don't want just good children. I want God-fearing children. They're two different kinds of people, right? I don't want... Uh, just a good marriage, I want a God-fearing marriage, right? I don't want, uh, I don't want uh, uh, friends in my life that are just good friends. I want God-fearing friends. Right? Now, absolutely, I have friends uh, uh, on the outer, and it's my job. I'm the missionary to them, absolutely, right? But I'm going to draw from people that are God-fearing kind of people. And the fifth one is this, how to future-proof your family. Number five, we're going to finish on this. Number five, we have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to change. There's no point learning something, right? Uh, 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 You can't go home and go, okay, cool. Pastor Tim just preached the message. Everything's going to be good now. (laughs) That's not how it works, right? I've heard the message. I've got the information. uh, Therefore, everything is now fixed. No, that's not how it works, right? There's going to be awkward conversations, right? There's going to be times set aside. Uh, there's going to be things that might need to be said in love and, 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 and looking uh, you know, for win-win situations. But change, there might need to be compromise for you. Change needs to happen. Um, any Paul McCartney fans here? Any Beatles fans? Yeah, yeah, come on. In 1995, he was interviewed and um, uh, this is a great interview about his life, his career, his music, and 
And uh, the guy writes songs like all the time. Like, I don't know if it's daily, but it's like all, he's just writing and just songs are being spewed out constantly. Now, in 1995, he told the story of this one song that he wrote that none of you ever heard. And the opening lyric was this. It was, scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs. That was the lyric. I don't want scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs. That was the lyric that he wrote for the song. And then he's like, you know what? I don't know if that would capture the minds of future generations. What does it even mean? Scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs. He wanted to write a great song and he didn't, re- he, he didn't think, I don't know if that would capture generations to come and go beyond. And so he scrapped the song and rewrote it. And he used the lyrics instead, yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. That's when you applaud and go, Tim, you're an amazing singer, right? <laughs> Three people, thanks a lot. <laughs> far out. <laughs> that song has been played six million times on the radio, not including streaming sites. Uh, number one, number one song on the radio. Six million, over six million times. Right. It's lasted the generations. Why? Because Paul was willing to change. He didn't just spit stuff out and let's see what happens. He was willing to change. And he changed the lyric and obviously success came his way. You future-proof your family by being willing to change. This is the most important thing. Of all the ingredients, this is the most important important because if you don't change then it's just information right but when we change and when we start working toward uh, 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 principles and practices right that will guarantee our family's future right it comes from changing Paul says this to the church of Philippi he says no dear brothers and sisters I have not achieved it yet but I focus on this one thing Forgetting the past and looking forward to lies ahead. Some of you here today maybe need to turn away from how you have used to respond. Or maybe you saw how dad responded or how mum responded. And you need to turn away from the past. You need to look forward to better habits. You need to look forward to better responses. He goes on to say this. He says, I press on to reach the end of the race. And I want to tell you today that you individually, but you as a family unit as well, you're in a race. And it's not a race against other people, right? It's, a, it's, it's your own destiny. It's your own calling. And God has this glorious plan, not just of salvation. That's the greatest, but also of favour, also of blessing, because those things are in the Father's house. And He wants your family to achieve those things and attain those things. God's plan is at the end of your time, at the end of all time, that you're there with your family. He wants none to perish. Right? That's, that's the race that we're in. Paul doesn't say here, I press on to make more money. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to press on to become more busier. I'm going to press on to work more hours so that I can get more money to get more stuff. I press on to become more important. I press on to get more followers and likes. I press on to have no problems in my marriage. I press on so that everything is perfect. I press on so that no one is unhappy with me. He doesn't say those things. He says, I press on to finish the race. I press on to finish the race. And I want to ask you this. What would change in your life right now if you saw your race as a cross country rather than a sprint? What would change in your life right now if you saw your marriage, you saw raising kids, you saw wanting to get married one day, right? You saw helping 
uh, the generations underneath you, maybe your children and maybe your grandchildren? What would change in how you respond? What would change in your decision making? What would change in your prayer? What would uh, what would change in making in in in, in uh, attending church with the saints? Right? What would change in your life if you saw your family and the race as a cross country rather than a sprint, as long term rather than short term? A race that has ups and downs. It's not straight and flat. A race where sometimes you will trip over and maybe even graze your leg. A race where sometimes you can sprint, sometimes you can walk, maybe sometimes you have to stop. What would change in your life if you thought about the end goal rather than the short-term gain? What would change in your life? We're so glad that you could join us for our Centro Church online service. If you did want to connect with us, don't forget to scan the QR code and fill out your details. Also, if there was something in the message that stood out to you and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, then scan that QR code, click the Say Yes to Jesus link, and one of our pastoral team will get in contact with you this week. We hope and pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street Ipswich at 9 a.m. or 5 p.m., or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10 a.m. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at Centro. Have a blessed day.